Um, so we'll go back to the beginning. Will your team be made public for all to know? I think it will help with adoption and what you're trying to do with CST. We've gone back and forth about that. Um, I, I think I spoke about this with you, or I don't remember if it was with you or, or somewhere else a few months ago, but like, look, the most important question that people should be asking here is not about, hey, can I see your face? Because obviously we're not doing that, right? The most important thing you should be asking is, is there a legal entity and is there a legal recourse for someone to go after these guys if they do something wrong, right? Because we've, we've seen projects in the very recent past in the Hex ecosystem have very poor answers for when their things break um, and very, li very little, if any, recourse um, from their customers or users um, who, are, who are interacting with their things, right? So like we're a US-based company, um, we're going to be regulated by FinCEN and FINRA and we've done KYC with solid proof. So if anything were to ever happen with one of our products, you can go after us legally and you can do that. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a US citizen to do that, right? So like we're, we're out there in a legal sense and the fact that like I'm not going to share my birth date and my physical address with you is like regrettable, I suppose, to some people, um, but it's, it's the world we live in right now. I can, I can quote someone very important on this subject, if you like. Uh, privacy is essential for us to function in the world. If you're curious as to who that was, it was Richard Hart about a month ago on Twitter Live Spaces. Uh, I'll give you even one better. Privacy is a basic human right, Richard said throughout the years as well. That's why we, he believes in a lot of good stuff, and that's why we sacrifice for it. And, uh, yeah, you know. Blood samples maybe later, but uh, not happening right now. There's legal recourse if something crazy happens, it sounds like. So. Yep, exactly. Uh, we got somebody asking about Alex said, will Pulse Chain have zero links to ETH merge, meaning ETH side censorship? You know anything about this one? What does Pulse Chain say from this? Um, I'm not sure of the exact concept on censorship there. Um, there is censorship is a difficult thing to to ascertain when it comes to this because there's a lot of a lot of services out there for compliance that we utilize who are recommending to us that we utilize their list of um, verified addresses on chain that have done something that we shouldn't be supporting so take for an example of this like th what they want to do in terms of compliance is say to us any address that has ever interacted um, with tornado.cash, you should not support in your fiat on ramp. Brian and, Armstrong. Yep. So, like, that's a really difficult um, stretch to get to, right? Like, yeah. I've used tornado.cash. Um, I, I don't feel like I should be restricted from using my own fiat on ramp. So, I guess I don't know if that answers the question exactly, Alex. But like, I don't know. There, there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of difficulty with the censorship of addresses, and we're we're trying our best to make sure that people are able to use the service irrespective of anything that they or their address might have done before. Um, but we don't have a lot of good clarity on this for when Pulse Chain comes. I'm sorry. I'm glad censorship is hard, at least in certain areas. It's, uh, I, I, I wouldn't like it the other way around. John Smith, will the on-ramp for CST be only with US dollars? As of right now, yes. Um, it will be stored in US dollars. So let's say you're an Australian user, um, you would very likely be able to make a payment using an Australian bank account or an Australian debit card, um, but it will be settled in US dollars and it will be stored in US dollars in the bank account in the United States and it will be allocated to you in the ledger and it will be distributed to you in US dollars. So I, I hope that answers the question. Gotcha. Is weight safe to claim? Um, I'll just... Put this one out here if you search for rh max weight crypto or weight token there are two different videos one where i go through it with this gentleman i go through the code we go through the code together read it all that stuff um nothing interesting came out of that uh run that's like a 20 25 minute video i suggest you check that one out if you want the full story also had david feeder on the other day on 100 percent uptime and uh i think i'm pretty sure what he said in that video was that he claimed it and didn't have any concerns. Uh, and then I referenced the original video. So we've, we've uh, there's a couple of videos out there that will talk about it. I'm pretty sure Crypto Coffee has talked about it. Um, a lot of other streamers have too. I haven't heard anyone say it's not safe. 
Um, I don't, I think, did you, uh, did Pulse please take a look at this and they gave the thumbs up? Yeah, they, they did. And we've actually had two audits on the contract, one on testnet and one on mainnet. There was actually, um, uh, not to scare anybody, but one person tried to claim the other day that they had interacted with the contract and their wallet had been drained as a result. It's clearly not the result of our contract because there are no spend permissions in our contract. So it's not actually possible. Um, but, you know, it does go to show you that you still need to be careful, right? Like you still need to make sure that you're using the right DAP, interacting with the right contract, because there are people out there who are trying to take advantage of Richard Hart ecosystem people all the time. I get messages daily that, hey, you know, I was just talking to you in a DM and I'm like, no, man, I would never DM you first. That's just not how we do things. So your people are going to try and victimize you. And you are right to be concerned about the safety of, of different tools. I just posted a link to uh, my blog for Militia Spark Contracts. I updated it recently uh, with some other uh, interesting stuff. Um, but essentially, every, most of it boils down to when you're interacting with a smart contract, check your browser and make sure the address looks like the one you're expecting, looks like the legit one. It's got a green, at least it doesn't have any red, you know, flashy lights or anything on it. And check the Ethereum address on Etherscan of the legit contract from multiple sources. You verified all that stuff with the one that MetaMask has prompted you to interact with. Those two things will save you, uh, or like the two best things you can do that I can think of. Uh, and then the blog talks about all this stuff in detail about all the different protections you can do. Um, but yeah, it is, is kind of great. So there, you can't go to a website and it drain all of your funds. It's not how this works at all. It is usually you're just mixing up the dApps, uh, it's some malicious contract, they've taken over a website, whatever it is, and you're just interacting with a malicious contract, uh, maybe on a malicious website. You're just not interacting with the right contract. That's where most of these attacks come from. You just click a, click a link, it's not gonna sell your money. Like that's not a thing. I don't, that's not, as far as I know, that's not possible. But if you click, click, click through these buttons, you assign signatures, you assign transactions, you you know click through, yes, on MetaMask, that can drain your money. So you gotta be careful what you're interacting with. Uh, let's see what other questions just going down. Red squirrel, you're awesome as usual. <laughs> Had a couple funny ones I'll get back to too. Uh, let's see. There we go. Hexual chocolate, one of my favorite names of anyone in the chat. <laughs> when UK see out on off ramp. <clears throat> yeah, good question. So this kind of goes for every jurisdiction that isn't the United States, except for Canada, where I don't have a good answer to this question yet. I'm sorry. Um, we're going to be talking to regulators directly and we're going to say the same things to UK regulators that we're saying to US regulators, right? We're, we're, not a cust we're not a custodian of a digital asset or fiat currency. We are a technology layer that is allowing people to mint their own stablecoin. And as a result, we should be regulated as such, as a technology company that makes software because that's what we do. And so our bank has already explained to us you, if you guys are, uh, or sorry, all of our or uh, service providers who are providing services in the technology layer have already said to us, we will provide services in any jurisdiction you want. There is no technical reason why we can't provide a service to in the UK. The only reason we wouldn't be able to is if we had received a cease and desist letter from the UK government or a regulator there. So as of right now, like we're doing the legwork to get in touch with these, uh, these groups um, such that we can operate. There is no specification from our service providers saying that we need to regionalize in any way, like have a, a bank in the UK, for example. Our US bank is more than happy to take money from UK customers. We don't have to regionalize banking, which is a really important thing. Um, so yeah, look, we're, we're doing our best. Uh, it depends a little bit on when Pulse Chain launches as to when the UK on ramp will be available, but it's a priority. What other founders do you know that speak so intelligently about the legalese, all the you know issues around uh, getting fiat on ramp to bank accounts, all the finance? What other founders do you know that talk like this? Good sign. Thanks, man. Very, very good sign. <laughs> What's the safeguard to keep the bank account back in coast from being liquidated by people removing funds or any other way, I guess? Yeah, no problem. So um, it's the ledger system. We should all be relatively similar, uh, familiar with ledgers given that we, we operate in blockchain, right? But it's a great question. 
So the way the ledger system works is that when you add fiat to it, let's assume we're using the on-ramp for a second, you add fiat to it, but then the fiat is immediately, um, it's originally allocated to you in the ledger. But then as soon as you mint your stable coin on chain, it's withdrawn from your assets in the ledger and put into the general asset pool, which backs the stable coin. So you as a person who comes back aren't able to withdraw anything from the bank account because it's not allocated to you in the ledger. In order for it to be allocated to you in the ledger, you would have to utilize the fiat off-ramp functions whereby, and this is where we're different to trust token, you actually burn your CST. So you will come back to the DAP, receive the burn address, send the burn address your CST, that will trigger a webhook, which will then allocate to you the ability to then withdraw fiat from the bank account. Very cool. Yep. Um, is there any plan to team up with Liquid Loans, or they would they be considered a competitor? Um, just just in general terms, I have I, I said this a little bit earlier, but like I have received communication from several different projects in the space who are interested in either partnering or at least having conversations about partnering. I haven't specifically had any of them tell me, hey, you're, you're clear to start talking about a potential partnership. So I just in, in to be respectful of them, I'm not going to do that yet. Um, but uh, from my perspective, no, I don't, I don't see Liquid Loans as being a competitor at all. In fact, I'm thrilled to use their service because uh, I don't want to sell Pulse ever. <laughs> so no, certainly not a competitor. Hashtag never selling. Exactly. Um, have you been approached by any of the biggest Chinese exchanges that want to list CST or weight? Uh, I have been approached by many exchange people uh, representing exchanges uh, and the product leads at exchanges over and over again. I must get 30 or 40 of them a day on Telegram. Uh, no, I, ha I, have, I don't think we are pursuing any of those things as of right now. <laughs> are, they are there pictures of pretty girls on those messages? Because... It typically comes that way. Not always. Sometimes, not but always. not always. Yeah. Yeah. That was a that was a throwback to when Richard said uh, Pulse Chain was going to be listed on some big Chinese exchange. Um, gotta get gotta get my RH quotes in there once in a while. It does Speaking make it very way, easy to ban people from uh, from the Telegram group, though. I'll, I'll admit. I I love the the option to delete message for both of you, so they can yeah. forget about my name. Like, ah, oh, that's actually one great Telegram feature. Uh, you covered this a little bit before. I'll just while we're talking about weight, I'll, I'll bring it up to Ben Hex. Uh, thoughts on weight staking to decrease on uh, on ramp fees or earn yield from fees? Hey whatever Ben, you can say whatever you can't say. Hey Ben, yeah. Look, I I can describe um, the mechanism a little bit if you like, um, which I think might be useful to you. The, there's a difference between the two, right? Decreasing fees for the on ramp does not constitute a security or a DAO or a business in any way. You're allowed to provide discounts to people for all sorts of reasons and you can choose what they are and it does not make you a registered or does not require you to register with the SEC. However, if you were to provide some sort of function where you could earn yield from that staking as opposed to a discount on a future function, it would very likely make you either a business um, requiring you to register as a business and therefore all of your stakers would be shareholders in the business. And so... I got this question the other day about whether or not we would be a DAO. That's kind of what you're describing when you describe like earning yield. And in fact, like we, we talked about this at one point, we were like, Hey, wouldn't it be cool if you could earn all of those on ramp and off ramp fees, if you were the staker of another asset and our legal team was just like, look, as soon as you do that, you're a security, you're a DAO. You need to register all of your shareholders. You need to provide them K ones. It's going to be a huge, huge nightmare. So just don't mm -hmm. go down that road. So if you're curious as to like why that mechanism isn't used, that's the reason. It's There's just too much regulatory risk around it. Um, in the case of staking generally, staking uh, to, to reduce fees in an on-ramp or an off-ramp is not a security, does not make the Coast stablecoin a security. So it is absolutely something we're going to employ um, with some sort of asset and will very likely have a fee-burning mechanism in there or a... Um, a deflationary aspect from unstaking, I think is the optimal thing to do there. Where like, say for example, in testnet, you are able to stake some pulse in order to reduce your on-ramp fee from 4% to 3%. Um, 
you you would we would try to incentivize you to lock that pulse for a long period of time kind of the same way one inch does with their dow except that we would charge you or the the contract would charge you a fee of say five percent if you were to unstake so the optimal game theory there being to like try and lock people in the contract um, and not have them unstake or if they do unstake at least it's deflationary on the asset so that's kind of the way we're thinking about that right now so again just to just clarify too you're thinking there there will there can be some sort of staking to decrease some of the on-ramp fees um what token that will be whether it's pulse or something else you don't know yet but that's something that won't make it a security and is doable and all these things it, it could be all sorts of stuff right like you could theoretically have it be a um a premium membership that you pay monthly or you could have it be an NFT, right? Like we could we could have some sort of system where you buy a Richard Hart, you know, looks like a puppy NFT, and that gets you or entitles you to those um, those off ramp or on ramp uh, discounts as well. So like there's there's multiple ways to do this, but ultimately like you'll you'll have to provide provide some sort of economic value and lock it in order to receive discounts, and and that's how we're going about it ideally with some sort of mechanism to have deflation because pulse has deflation pulse x has deflation you know we're trying to take assets off the market if we can so that's that's the idea gotcha uh let's see is it similar to centralized i don't know what centralized you know what centralized is uh no i'm not super familiar with centralized i'm sorry okay um so basically, you are a bank linked to Pulse Chain, so we can do transactions. Um, <laughs> not not necessarily. I, I'm sorry if it, it, it's come across that way. There is a bank account. The bank account is administered by Coast, but it is at a U.S. financial institution. So all of the deposits are FDIC insured. Um, when you interact with the bank account you're interacting as a member of the ledger. So you are entitled to um, the assets in the bank account that you contribute and you can either contribute fiat or you can contribute CST by burning it on chain, one of the two. So there is a banking facility, but we are not technically the bank, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Uh, can you explain the issue with Fireblocks not supporting Hex Norwich products implications for excuse me, centralized listings? Yeah, great question. So um, <clears throat> one of the things that most stablecoin providers do is have a custody mechanism. Um, they can do this either with uh, assets in a bank account like fiat or more, more commonly, they do it with assets on chain like a stablecoin or potentially other assets as well. So like in your... Um, in your hosted wallet on your uh, on your Abra account, for example, on on mobile, right? Um, you are uh, you are adding money to it, but you don't get a choice in which asset it, it gets turned into, right? It gets turned into CS a uh, TUSD, and it's technically custodied by by Abra and by Trust Token, who are actually just a reseller of this. Uh, one particular company that provides a massive amount of the blockchain infrastructure, which is called Fireblocks. They're based out of Israel. And if you use any sort of um, wallet service um, in the US or in Europe, you're very likely actually using a, a Fireblocks pro product that has been reskinned and resold as whatever brand you're interacting with. So the issue used to be the case that Hex was not supported by Fireblocks, which is why you couldn't buy it on all sorts of different, you know, apps and, and CEX services. Um, we only discovered this was the, the primary reason when we tried to go and actually use Fireblocks as a custodian, because when we first tried to start doing this, this stablecoin project, we wanted to be a custodian, realizing later that, hey, this isn't the best way to do this. So we interfaced with Fireblocks and we literally asked them, like, why won't you support Hex? And they just said, no one's ever asked us to because mm -hmm. there, there just wasn't enough demand for it. Like there, the end users for all of these apps weren't asking the app developers, hey, can you list Hex so I can buy it? it, it it's just that simple. So we put a request in and lo and behold, six months later, Fireblocks actually does support Hex. None of these other providers do because they're still not getting the request from the end users. 
but Fireblocks will. And, and that kind of like snowballs into, um, you know, stuff to do with Pulse Chain. If Fireblocks were to support Pulse Chain, it would be a huge benefit for everybody in the ecosystem because then we could all go to our Abras and our Voyagers and all of the other apps that we use and mm. be like, hey, your service provider provides uh, uh, or facilitates this and has custody for this. We want access to it, but we can't even do that right now. And so the, the, the main thing that the, the whole ecosystem could benefit from, like we're trying to do it ourselves, right? We're trying to build fiat on an off-ramp without custody, which has its own benefits. But for all the people who are using these other tools, what we should really do is crowdfund enough money, which is about four or 500 grand, to go to Fireblocks and just pay them to support Pulse Chain, because that way all of these other services could then do it. Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, I mean, we did it for NASCAR, didn't we? That happened. Yeah. That was a thing. It, it, from, from what I've heard from Fireblocks directly, uh, from their biz dev team, is they would support Pulse Chain if we gave them something like two months and 400 grand. Don't quote me exactly on the figures and the timeline, but that's the, the best guidance that I've been given. A lot of rich Hexkins out there. Hope you're listening. Or just a bunch of uh, small to medium players who, uh, who want to who make this happen. So, yeah. I mean, we, uh, we've shown as a group that we can raise money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, can this be linked with RH Wallet, a partnership? Oh, almost certainly. Yep. Yep. Um, that sort of goes to or, or speaks to um, Richard's sort of vision for vertical integration. And uh, I think an RH wallet would be fantastic. I, um, I would use it. I'd probably switch over from MetaMask or, or whatever else to it um, pretty quickly. Um, but I, I might just build on top of that, um, mate, uh, Bob, I think it is, and just say like there the eventual sort of exit strategy for us with Coast is not even for it to be a partnership between us and Richard. It's for Richard to just take this business over, right? Like he wants vertical integration. He wants to, to do this. Like our business is for sale to him anytime he wants it. We'll make it a very reasonable price. It can be effectively a loss leader. We don't need to get rich on it. We're already asset holders in the space. Um, if he wants vertical integration, we've done the legwork, we've done the paperwork, we've got the licensure, we've employed the lawyers, it's all there ready for him. So instead of trying to do it all himself with exchange licenses and whatnot, he can just come talk to us and take it over. Richard, if you're listening, if you see this, there's a, uh, there's a dev team building some products that uh, may be able to help with vertical integration. And uh, wow, that wouldn't that be something? It would. Uh, so hold the weight token. Well, if you look at the chart, those who uh, held it and waited, looking pretty good, according to the charts. The people who are up the most are the ones who uh, who haven't minted it. <laughs> or there, that too. Yeah, I guess there's two aspects. Either one, you can wait longer uh, before you mint it to get more of the free claim, or you can buy it off the market and then hold it. And then if you believe price go up, then maybe price go up. That's, I guess that's, is that the two main strategies, I guess, with weight? Uh, yeah. Yep. I think, I think ideally the, op the optimal game theory that we built in is, hey, you really want to claim this as close to Pulse Chain launch as possible. Um, I might just touch on that quickly, if you don't mind, Max. Um, Go for it. We, we get this question a lot about weight. Um, when will weight minting be turned off? Where will it be when Richard Hart announces Pulse Chain's coming next week? Or will it be when the first block is validated on Pulse Chain? The answer is the latter. We will launch or we will turn off minting on weight as soon as the first or as soon as possible um, after the first block has been validated, irrespective of whether Richard has announced it or not. So that's where the concept of playing chicken with the billionaire comes in, right? You're not playing chicken with us. You've got to time Richard. And if he doesn't tell you in advance, you will not know. Mid-May. Midnight, exactly. Um, what is a project? Okay, I guess what if, I don't know how to read. I think you get the gist of the question. It's hard to read, but the gist of it. What if a project comes out before Pulse launches? Does it impact the projects? Um, I, I'm not sure if that uh, counts for maybe eligibility. Um, 
but look, it, that would that would speak to work and managerial effort. So I think what this person's asking is whether or not we will include other projects um, for the weight free claim. Is that your mm -hmm. reading of it too, Max? That that's one interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. Look, if that if that's the the way I'm supposed to take this, then no, that that's not the case. It's it's immutable. The projects that are included are, are can't change, unfortunately. The other thing that came to mind was um, how does weight how is weight impacted with pulse chain launch? We're just getting two coins. Anything else change? Um, <clears throat> as of right now, I think, yeah, we definitely get two coins, assuming that we've claimed it in advance and assuming we have our shares of our midnight bonus. Um, I suppose theoretically, if you didn't want to mint your midnight bonus on pulse chain for some reason, you wouldn't have to. Um, but that's the only caveat I can think of there. Gotcha. Just wait. Wait and find out. I love the puns. Uh, I claimed after I heard the coffee stream. Yeah. Glad you were able to get on with uh, Mr. Coffee. Uh, definitely lots of people watching that one. Uh, so more than 10% of sacrifices have claimed? Uh, no, not quite. I, I think it's about, uh, about 30,000 people have interacted with the contract, Ben. But the vast majority of those have just checked database to see if they're eligible. They haven't actually minted. So there, there's different functions in the weight contract that allow you to perform different steps. So the, the most important thing to do if you want to lock in your midnight bonus is to actually claim and mint your tokens. But a lot of people prefer to just come and check their eligibility, lock their eligibility in, and then um, they can come back anytime and just check and see how much more weight they have without minting. So there's a three-step process on the website to mint, but you certainly don't have to complete all three at the same time. You can just do number one or number one and two and then sit and wait for um, for a better opportunity when you'll get more tokens. Gotcha. Ask him about chargebacks. Oh, man. Chargebacks are tricky. <clears throat> so um, there is a... a pretty easy way to avoid chargebacks um, and it is only accepting one payment method which is wire transfers so if we wanted to avoid chargebacks altogether that's the way we would do it um, there is actually though some pretty solid information online about all of us that we're not aware of which is our risk of chargebacks um, so our compliance providers provide us with a risk assessment of each customer um, and the likelihood that they will perform a chargeback. And so part of our workflow in issuing the currency is utilizing that risk profile for that individual user. Um, and it, it's pretty in-depth information. Um, so, you know, some of that would be like, there are uh, moments in, in the workflow where we wouldn't accept a, a customer until they provide more information. Like if there's a mismatch with their phone number and their billing address for their phone uh, provider, things like that. Um, so we're, we're hoping that our early intervention in terms of customer acquisition or, or verification actually um, prevents a lot of the issues with chargebacks later on. Um, and then there might be the case that a high risk person is only able to do wires, for example. Mm. Good question. Can someone tell me why anyone would be excited about Pulse Chain now? There are several state forks. Well, I don't know if you're interested in being rich, financially free, if you've seen richer success before and you think it may rhyme in the future. Um, why, you know, why did, why is any other chain successful? Because they have, you know, people behind them who want to make it successful and great marketing, all that stuff. Um, I don't know. I can't be more excited. I could care less about any forks happening. That doesn't, I don't factor them in to the, to the uh, appreciation component of PLS or PLSX. I, I can give you one. Uh, PulseX. You should be excited about PulseX. PulseX is going to be the only DEX that has a massive deflation in the core asset that it utilizes for the DAO and for all of the voting on the pairs that are incentivized. And PulseX is not going to be available on any other chain, right? Uniswap is in a whole bunch of places now, Arbitrium and, and wherever else, or Polygon you're only going to be able to interact with PulseX on the Pulse chain. So I think that's an incredibly useful thing um, for adoption and for getting people excited about it. Yeah. And I'm answering this question like super 
seriously, not being sarcastic, like my excitement has been at a 10 since last year. It has not wavered. Maybe even went to 11, maybe. It definitely hasn't went down, no matter what happens. Um, will you expand to Europe? It's kind of the same question uh, or the same answer as for the UK. Um, we've actually been approached by an attorney in, uh, I think it was Slovenia recently, um, about providing services in Europe. That was just in the last couple of days. Um, so obviously we need to vet him and, and his motives and background and whatnot. But um, yeah, look, we, we've got people who are reaching out to us trying to help with things like that already. So um, when, I mean, as soon as possible to when Pulse Chain launches and not before. <laughs> Gotcha. When test net, sir? We're still putting a little bit of work into the front end. We um, are mindful of the fact that there was a lot of criticism of the weight front end when we first launched it, Poss possibly because we spent three weeks on it and just wanted to get it out very quickly. Um, in the case of, of uh, Coast Stablecoin, we're going to spend a lot more time on, on um, user flows and UX and, and making it really pretty before we release something on test net. I'm also like not clear necessarily on how many people would want to dox themselves and go through KYC for a testnet coin. However, I have um, I haven't talked to our, our marketing team about this yet. But marketing team, if we could do a Twitter poll and find out how many people would actually do that, that might be useful info. Well, I mean, for testnet, can you just say okay, everyone's good, right? Because you're not actually transferring the money on testnet, right? You could, but that's not really the part of the system that we need to test. That's yeah. actually relatively simple to do. We could knock that together in 45 minutes. Um, but it but, gets the people going, 45 minutes. Yeah, we, you, it, that particular contract is already written and it's already working. So we could release that, you know, by seven o'clock. <laughs> um, well, seven you heard it. You heard it. Is it seven o'clock Eastern or Central? Uh, it'd be eight o'clock for me, but it'd be Central for seven for you. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah. We, we want we could, China we, to buy weight. We could put that together pretty quickly. Um, I mean, if you're a weight holder, you probably want everyone to buy a weight, right? China's got a billion people. We, uh, I'm okay with their money. I'm not always, I'm not okay with their influence in a lot of ways, but their money in this particular case of weight, don't see a problem with it. Are the funds insured by the bank? Yeah. You said, uh, FDIC. Yep. So, um, yeah. we're not exactly clear on the limits with this. So, Mark, because it's um, what's called a for the benefit of bank account, the limits are a little bit unclear as to whether the limit is on the total. The insurance covers the total deposits or the insurance covers each, each individual person in the ledger. I believe it's the latter, but I'll get confirmation of that. If it's not, then I believe we would just have assets in the ledger split across different FBO accounts. But I'm pretty sure that isn't required. And I know other stablecoin providers don't have to do that. So um, I think the answer is, is pretty definitively yes. You guys talked about the off-ramp series of events. I think we did. You want to just briefly, like just you know, 60 seconds, uh, talk about that? Yeah, sure. Look, you have to be in the ledger and you have to have completed KYC in order to, um, to go through the steps to do the off-ramp. Um, if you like just randomly send your CST to the burn address and then come back to us and talk to us and be like, hey, I did this, you know, give me my fiat, we're not going to be able to do that, right? It's, it's just not going to work. So you will have to come to the website, you'll have to have an account, you'll have to do KYC. And then when you're ready to exchange your CST for fiat, you would send your CST to the burn address. It would, rec the DAP would recognize you because you've linked your, Pulse address to the DAP, and then we would read that that transaction has happened, and we would allocate the resources to you in the ledger, which would then trigger you to. Um, you would probably have to perform another action. It might not be an automated step to withdraw from the FBO account to your bank account. I suspect it'll be a manual transaction, um, but it'll be one: you send money to the or send CST to the burn address. Two: you withdraw money from the FBO to your other bank account. Gotcha. So AJ, uh, t -t 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 just going through. I'm like I'm 20 minutes behind on questions, but uh, man, we got some good ones. Y'all are doing great. You're good. I'll keep going if you like. Yeah. No, I I I wasn't suggesting we stop. If you're okay with it. I'd yep. I'd like to get to some more of this stuff. 
And I haven't asked. I still got some questions to ask you. I just want to go get to the AMA portion. Uh, let's see. Maybe this one. If someone has not used Coast on ramp, how do they use off ramp? Let's say they hold CST when to redeem USD. Do they need to sign up? Hmm. Yep. Interesting question. Yep, they absolutely need to sign up. They need to be in the ledger the same way anyone using the on ramp does. Um, creating an account and performing KYC is what puts you in the ledger as a beneficiary in the bank account. Um, the the two ways to have assets in the FBO account are one, you can burn CST in the off-ramp or two, you can add fiat um, via a payment method. So yes, you absolutely will need to do sign up and KYC to use the off-ramp. And it's not a requirement that you use the on-ramp to use the off-ramp or vice versa. Gotcha. Why don't you build this on-ramp in BSC Ethereum? Because we were trying to pump Pulse Chain, bro. Huh. I I guess. I mean, you can give it. You have a better explanation. Uh, yeah. Look, we've we've been asked about this before. We have absolutely no interest in trying to get economic energy onto BSC. We are in the top groups of sacrifices for Pulse Chain and for PulseX, and we've got individuals in our team who are involved in almost all of the other sacrifices. Like, we want to see this ecosystem do well. We are spending inordinate <laughs> amounts of money uh, and resources in order to do it. We're doing this without a sacrifice. We haven't asked for a cent from the community, uh, which is not to denigrate those that have. You know, you, you use yeah. that mechanism if it makes sense for you. We're very securities minded, so we're not going to use that mechanism ourselves. We're going to spend our own money. And as a result, we want everybody's resources going towards Pulse Chain. Yeah, it's uh, you're not up for those baby gains. You don't want those BSC Ethereum baby gains. Yeah, um, yeah that, that's, that's another good point too. That's and I'm not the jury's still out. Obviously, these products need to be built. I'm not making a, you know determination or anything on the quality of the products or anything so far. But if you think about the people who haven't asked you for money in the ecosystem that have built amazing products, Hedron, Akosa, Watsa, that ecosystem. Uh, Maxi team perpetuals ecosystem. They built products that pump hex, positive feedback loop, do all kinds of great stuff. You know, we we imagine they're going to succeed in the future. They never ask for money. Uh, as as Stoic said, not to knock on anyone who's asked for money, sacrifice. Hey, you need to fund the project. Totally get the idea. But it's interesting this that some of these projects are not asking for any of the money. Some of the free claims, not all the free claims, but a lot of the free claims, a lot of the platforms being built, don't ask you for money. It's not, it's not a red flag. I'll say that. It's not a red flag. Uh, yeah. If anyone knows Richard and talks to him on a daily basis, get him to watch uh, two minutes. Of the, I'll just ask for two minutes of his time, two minutes of the stream, and he can decide uh, if he wants to invest in Coast. Um, if he likes what – I mean, I, he, he'll probably be like, I don't know anything about them. I got to see the product first, and then he'll wait till it comes out, and he'll be like, oh, you know, and then make a determination there, if I were to imagine that if he even spent the time, you know, billionaire's time is uh, pretty valuable. I think you covered this, but uh, yeah, quickly, how long after full seeing launch will mint that bonus be available? It will be available to mint as soon as possible or as, as soon after the first block is validated as humanly possible, um, irrespective of when the announcement comes. So if, if the chain is live and blocks are being validated, we will end it. And if Richard hasn't said anything about that, that's okay. Like it'll still be done first, right? We're not, we're not going to be sitting around waiting for Richard to tell us. Gotcha. Um, please take KMX. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, it's kind of a, a good uh, segue into um, what types of uh, cards and stuff uh, will you be taking? It'll depend a little bit, like I mentioned before, on the risk profile of individuals. So if you're considered a low risk person by our compliance software, you will very likely be able to send wires, do debit card transactions, send ACH payments. In fact, ideally, we wouldn't even hold up ACH payments for a settlement date um, or a chargeback date, as, as was referred to previously. Um, that's certainly the intention. Um, but if you come to us and you're a high risk person who has had, um, for example, if, if you're cross referenced with FINRA and you're shown to have, have performed functions in some sort of uh, illegal means or in some sort of fashion that's been reported to FINRA, 
it would increase your risk uh, score with our, our supplier or our compliance provider. So as a result, your particular payment methods would likely be restricted. I don't know to what, because I can't speak to this person's specific circumstances. Gotcha. What's up, Gifford? Anybody want some uh, some Pulse, uh, not Pulse, uh, maybe he's got that too, some Hedron, Icosa, what's a uh, good information? Go follow this gentleman. He, uh, he is almost becoming a regular on 100% of time every few weeks or so. Uh, that he's that another another galaxy brain in the house. Uh, Gifford asked, uh, "How will the ESW fork effect weight front end claim in that bonus?" Yeah, good question. Um, I think there's probably a pretty good case that you could uh, make a change to the front end. Um, you know, that's making a change to a front end is not making a change to the product. The product is the smart contract, right? So um, making a quick change to the, um, to the weight front end to allow you to interact with ETHW, I, um, thinking off the top of my head here, I, I know that some other people have already done this this evening. So uh, it's probably something we'll look into tomorrow. Gotcha. Thoughts on changing the ticker to XCST. Don't some ideals out there. Yeah, look, we're not married to CST. Um, we, I think we'd probably like to focus group this or, or do some Twitter polls and see what everybody would like to use. Uh, we, we were considering um, a project that was a little bit too much for us to bite off at the time, which was USDX. Um, we've, we've tried a couple of others as well, but um, you know, may, maybe it just turns out that everybody wants it to be USDP or USP. That's certainly possible too. Okay. Um, let's post a couple more and then we'll get back to uh, the doc and wrap up here. God, I love that name, Hexual Chocolate. Appreciate it, man. Tin Tops here. Hello, sir. Um, I had a couple questions here. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I will let him answer the question before I start the puns. Jeez. I can't get a little bit excited. I know you probably say it tongue, tongue in cheek, anyways. Um, let's see. We had a question. Mr. Kupatso, can I withdraw more than my initial deposit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as long as there's enough money in the um, in the shared bank account, you can withdraw whatever amount that you burn. So the, obviously there will never be more CST in existence than, um, than is represented in the bank account. So it's not going to be possible for anybody to, uh, to withdraw or, or burn enough to be able to drain the, the bank account completely. So it's really just a question of how much you can acquire on chain. And as long as you're KYC, you can burn as much as you want and withdraw as much as you want. Gotcha. You've ran the math. You sure about that? Pretty sure. So I want to ask too, like what were people thinking out there? Okay, fiat on ramps. Hey, we got Simplex. We got, you know, credit card services. We got Coinbase. We can use with MetaBask, things like that. What, what is, you know, what is CST? What is a stable coin? And what is this platform? doing that's just better you know, is it, how is it more frictionless how is it you know why would why'd you why would you use this versus anything else yeah look there's trade-offs in any product that you use um there's regulatory risk and there's uh custodial risk in and and these vary across all of the different tools we are trying to create the tool for pulse chain with the fewest uh actions that a person has to perform with the lowest humanly possible level of KYC. So for example, we're not going to ask you for selfies. You don't have to hold a, a date on a piece of paper up next to your head and send us a photo. Um, and we're trying not to custody your asset for you. Your asset, your, your fiat in your bank account is your asset, not ours. And we want you to be able to mint stablecoin against your asset similarly in another bank account, which is yours, according to the ledger. So, you know, it's, it's a question of sovereignty for us. We, we want you to have access to your stuff. So um, if you think that's valuable, then I encourage you to, to look more into our project as we, as we make uh, waves and, and improve it. You talked about Simplex having some pretty high fees too, right? Is that a major reason why this would be a, you know, a, a better option than, than them? Yeah, well, I mean, just, just I, I mentioned earlier, right? Like there's a lot of fiat on ramps, but there's many fewer or orders of magnitude fewer off ramps. Um, 
So look, look uh, Simplex, you can run a transaction and pay $1,000 and get about 830 somewhere in that range, um, USD. So you're paying a 17% premium there for that, for that privilege. And yeah, okay, cool. You can use your Amex. They ding you 2% as well, right? So now you're at 19 or 20% um, for the ability to get economic value onto the chain. And, um, and, and they're a custodian as well, in a sense. So um, look, we're trying to do this with the minimal fees possible. In fact, that's part of what our use case is to regulators, right? We're, we are not um, trying to turn this into a billion dollar enterprise. We're not trying to be Coinbase. We're not trying to increase shareholder profit or, or equity so that we can do a cash out and go public, right? That, that's not our use case. That is not our exit strategy. Um, we want this to be taken over to, um, by Richard so that he can have the vertical integration that he's looking for. And we're just trying to help make it happen. So um, yeah, like that, that's why you would use the, this product and, and why you would use our fee structure as opposed to, to going with one of those other options. And talked about before, you know, when I evaluate projects, uh, I tweeted about this and kind of went through, you know, does it kind of top to bottom, does it have a positive feedback loop with the blue chips, X, you know, pulse chain, pulse X, any of them, uh, does it have utility? Um, does it, or is it, you know, is it a meme coin? Is it unknown? Is it, um, or does it just, you know, not have anything and just kind of like a fun coin that you can, you just trade pump and up style, whatever. Um, how would you, where, where do you think that CST and the platform fits in? And where do you think weight fits into those? Uh, if you were to kind of uh, round them into those type of categories. Yeah, look, weight's pretty simple. You, you can develop some economic energy for your ability to delay gratification. It's a skill that we all need to, to learn. Um, it's one of the most important things in personal and financial development. And so if nothing else, at least that is going to train that muscle memory um, to be able to get economic energy for, for being patient. Um, in the case of Coast, um, we, we really want to make a frictionless way to get economic energy onto the chain. That's why we're not going to support any other chains, even if we're asked about it. And, um, you know, you, you can see sort of in, in the way we're designing the product that we're not trying to duplicate feature sets with anybody else. Right, we could have gone down the the route of being an exchange, um, and that would have taken buy pressure away or or uh, volume away from PulseX. We don't want that, right? Similarly, like we could have designed a custodial wallet um, to do this with, and and that probably would have taken away user base from um, from internet money. So, like, we don't want to do those things, right? We we want those other projects to be successful. So we're not going to build our own wallet, and we're not going to provide exchange fees and or exchange mechanisms. And we're going to just try and drive people to Pulse Chain and we're going to drive them to Pulse X and we're going to be the, hopefully the, the, the frictionless way to do all these things so that when people are trying to onboard others, um, they're very comfortable sending them to Coast because we'll be a gateway and then there'll be all sorts of things they can discover in the ecosystem once they've gone beyond us. Gotcha. It sounds like more of a, I mean, at least utility. I mean, is there... I mean, the, I guess you could fit positive uh, feedback loop as far as CST goes with getting money into the ecosystem um, for Pulse and stuff. Um, is, is, that, is that the main use case as far as, you know, why you would use this product is, is you're able to get fiat into a stable coin on Pulse chain to then get money into whatever you want. Maybe it's Chulse Chain, maybe it's PulseX, maybe, you know, whatever it is. Is that the main you know, reason people use the product? It is. You're also trying to, to use products um, that don't create unnecessary risk. And so, for example, like, I'm not a huge fan of bridges. Um, I'm sure Richards is probably going to operate pretty well. I'm, I'm relatively confident of that. And I imagine that I will use it. But for the average person who's coming into this, like, I, I, you know, you and I, Max, would probably be considered power users in the space and, and how much we interact with the chain. But for people who are new, the idea of buying on a SEX or a CEX and then sending it out to um, sending your asset to a, a hosted or your own hosted wallet and then, um, and then trying to interact with a bridge to get back to your own wallet, like, it's just confusing for people. And 
I mentioned this on, on another stream, like you, you've kind of, I, I did a lot of work in e-commerce for a long time and the more options and the more steps you give people, the bigger your drop-off rate in like a shopping cart or a checkout process. And so we have to think about it in those terms. Like there are people who, when you present them with a red shirt and a blue shirt, will say no shirt and they will leave. And that's important to know if you're trying to get people to go through the whole process. So we need to make this process shorter. We need to make it all in one place and we need to make it as seamless as possible so that when one of us is onboarding a friend of ours and they're asking us a question, the question is really easy to answer and it's not, well, let me check your RPC code or let me check these four things or go to this URL or watch this half a minute video, right? Like it's great that those things are out there and there's resources for us, but we need to not need them. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Um, are there any arbitrage opportunities with CST you can see that would, would be available? Uh, yeah, potentially. Um, it's a good question. I haven't heard someone ask that yet, but um, I would imagine the CST will have pretty thick liquidity with Pulse, um, firstly. So, um, But then I also think it'll probably have pretty thick liquidity with any algo stable coins like um like liquid loans or USDL, like loan or USDL. So there might be some ARB opportunities between the two of them more so than just like with CST itself. That's what I would expect. Gotcha. Before we wrap up, I got a couple more questions here. Uh, any use trying to get PayPal on board or PayPal support in general, like indirectly or directly with this? Um, at this point, no. Um, and I'm a little bit hesitant to try, frankly, um, because I know that PayPal is placing some of those restrictions like those tornado.cash restrictions on eligible addresses. And I'm certain that that would restrict the number of people who could use it. Um, so you like think about the user experience. Like I wouldn't want a person to come to the CST website or the Coast website and see a PayPal payment method and then have that use of the PayPal or the attempt to use the PayPal method result in us getting a, um, a fraud uh, claim by our compliance team mm. or, or have that mean that we then have to send a report to FinCEN because PayPal has told our uh, compliance team that this person from this address has done something, um, you know, malicious in the past. It, th there's a lot of uncertainty in the space and I think PayPal will add to it. So as much as I know a lot of people, um, you know, like to use it, I think as ex exactly as that person just said, like it could absolutely be a liability for us and our users. Strategic avoidance. Yep. Yep. Um, I think the only question we have left is we love you and this project is brilliant. Awesome AMA. I, I can't tell I, whether he's talking to you or me here. I'm going to say it to you. I'm There's say a little you, bit man. of mix here. There's a little bit of mix going on. <laughs> We're just going to say you love both of us and we, we're going to send that love back. Appreciate uh, yeah, all your good questions, Mr. Kaboot. You got to tell me how to pronounce your name at some point. Capazzo. 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 Mr. Capazzo. 